quiet your cleverness. Um, come at this with a place of curiosity. And that's like a guiding practice for any successful biomimic, which includes setting ego aside, setting aside this notion that you have all the answers. Welcome to the Native Seed Pod. I'm your host and pollinator, Melissa Nelson. I'm excited to introduce you to a new special podcast series and partnership as part of our Native Seed Pod Season 4, Knowledge Symbiosis. Can traditional ecological knowledge and biomimicry harmonize? This special series is co-produced in partnership with the Biomimicry Center at Arizona State University, co-directed by Sara El Said and the Learning from Nature podcast. This Knowledge Symbiosis series is co-produced and co-broadcast with Learning from Nature, the Biomimicry podcast with Lily Ehrman. You can listen to Learning from Nature and the Native Seed Pod wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is part two of my conversation with Dana Baumeister, hosted and moderated by Sara El Said. The two worlds of, of biomimicry and indigenous knowledge are often seen from the outside world in very different ways. For example, Dana, you might have interfaced that a, people think of biomimicry as very technology focused, often thought of something very utilitarian and really based in Western science. And maybe, Melissa, you might have also seen that people, when they think about traditional ecological knowledge, might fluctuate between thinking of it as being maybe too general for it to be useful to us, and sometimes even the opposite, just like too specific, too locally based, maybe vague, romanticized. So these are like the ways that people see these two fields. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, how you think these two worlds uh, in relation to how people see it as well can potentially have synergies? How can we synergize between them and weave between them? But also what are some of the frictions that you see? So these are two big questions and whoever wants to get started on this. I think it's interesting that, and, and this is probably what I'm most interested in unpacking because there's the perception of these two fields that's the in the zeitgeist, if you will. And then there's actually what these two fields are about. And I think those are two different conversations. For example, the way you just described biomimicry is like a lazy man version, right? It's the way that the media might shortcut it. And who's ever writing the article never bothered to actually find out what it is. A non-practitioner's version of of what it's about, right? And especially in our world, when we use the word biomimicry versus biomimetics or bio-inspired design, I think practitioners of biomimetics or practitioners of bio-inspired design are more in line with the way you described, based exclusively on Western science, tends to be technology-based, more specific in that realm. Whereas practitioners of biomimicry who have studied it with us, either through the program at Arizona State University or studied it with Biomimicry 3.8, and as Janine intended in her book, who coined the term biomimicry, if you understand it at that deeper level, then it's 
to me, far more aligned with my perceptions and awareness of indigenous knowledge systems and science. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dana. I think that's really an astute observation. And I think it's clear that biomimicry is really a field now. It's an unfolding field that has a science methodology. It has practitioners. It has theory and practice. It's grown out of the Western scientific field of biology into bringing in design and some creative intersections with other sciences and designs. So it really is, I'd say, more of a in a way, an established and emerging field with you both as leaders, along with Janine and many others. Whereas TEK, traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous science, indigenous knowledge systems, there are over 500 nations within the United States alone, distinct nations. And so the diversity is so great. Some Native people are really actually adamantly against this concept of a generic indigenous knowledge or TEK as a unified field, again, because it's so locally attuned to peoples, languages, ecosystems, landscapes, watersheds in those particular areas, along with variable histories of colonization, pre-colonial migrations, and then post-colonial interactions and interference. Now, having said that, there are plenty of people, myself included, are advocating for a field, a safe space within academia, within government, within activist movements, within a nonprofit field, for there to be more of a unified field of understanding of indigenous sciences or indigenous knowledges. So right from the get-go, there are some just tensions that we're not comparing apples and apples, right? We're comparing apples and oranges. Even the foundations are very distinct, and yet we are getting at very similar goals. We want to create human societies that are in harmony with natural cycles and natural systems so that we can regenerate human life and biodiversity so that they flourish together, that we flourish together in regenerative ways and sustainable ways and to enhance biodiversity and innovation without so much destruction that we see with our current forms of economic extractivism and worldviews of colonialism and settler uh, colonial ways. So philosophically, it's a big, tall order. And yet here we are, we're like courageous people to talk about it. And I feel that there is a knowledge symbiosis. I feel that these forms of knowledge can work harmoniously and reciprocally together. I've learned so much from you both and other biomimicry practitioners and experts the scientific precision of really diving deep into understanding biological systems and natural systems has been so informative. And indigenous science, indigenous knowledge also dives deep into understanding particular organisms, whether that's basing our whole calendar system on 13 moon cycles with the 13 segments on a turtle's back. So for the Ojibwe, we have our whole time system and calendaring system based on the turtle. That's why we call North America Turtle Island. So many teachings about really emulating, mimicking, or harmonizing with the wisdom encoded in that biological system, a very ancient species, the turtle, the tortoise. So that's just one example. So I think we can find great resonance in trying to understand these examples and we can bring them together. It's almost like we should unpack these further in the sense that it, like when I hear knowledge and maybe it's my connection with the word, but to me it feels static, right? It, it feels like mm. a list of answers or a list of explanations. It's like, it's a, it's content. And for me, with the way I perceive and of course, it's called traditional ecological knowledge, which to me is a, the listing of those things, okay, the 13 moons and so on. What I find perhaps even more fascinating 
is like three things. One is the practice of gaining that knowledge, right? And what these two things have in common, these two practices have in common with regards to the practice, the art of becoming wise, the art of becoming knowledgeable, I think would be really interesting to explore. So that's one. And maybe related to that, what tools are used to gain that knowledge? And probably more like frameworks as opposed and or methodologies as opposed to scanning electron microscope kind of tool. The third piece is, and this is the the part that I'm most fascinated about, is the deep lessons and patterns and principles that might be considered knowledge, but not knowledge for knowledge's sake, right? Like I studied biology, but it was like, I'm just learning this for what? But so knowledge, not just to know it, but to put it to work. And so what are those principles of biomimicry? We call them life's principles, but what are those principles that can then be put to work to the purpose that you just acknowledged that we have in common? Like one is quieting human cleverness, right? Quiet your cleverness. Um, Come at this with a place of curiosity. That's like a guiding practice for any successful biomimic, which includes setting ego aside, setting aside this notion that you have all the answers. And another piece is stepping off of the human-centric stool, right? Stepping off of that pedestal, assuming that humans are like the epitome of evolution, like there were some sort of pinnacle, which is just nonsense, right? So stepping aside, becoming an animist in your perspective are at the high level framings, which also guide then practice. And then we have specific methodologies. As you said, it is an emerging discipline. So what does it mean to the biomimicry thinking methodology begins with a process of really understanding the context of the challenge or opportunity. We call it scoping. Then there's a discovering phase where you're like, who in the natural world is facing those same sort of functional challenges and in what context? So there's a process by which you can be open to the lessons that might emerge. Then there's a translation component, right? What is the lesson that I need to take back to the design world? How can I create some solution with that lesson? And then an evaluation phase. Am I, have I done right by nature? Have I done this in a way that's honoring the lesson, honoring the context, and honoring the guiding principles? So that's the biomimicry thinking methodology. And then the life's principles, which are these ubiquitous things that all life forms have in common. If everybody on the planet is doing it. Maybe we ought to do it as well. And there's 26 of those. So that's another guiding piece. Those become, to me, they're more important than this is the specifics of how a turtle shell absorbs impact. But the lesson around being locally attuned and responsive gets at the context of 13 moons in a year. And shouldn't we guide and use those cycles as opposed to some ridiculous Roman calendar that's just nonsense because Caesar had an ego, right? Yeah. Let's see biomimicry as a natural extension and actually has its foundations, but is using and leveraging some of the existing dominant paradigms to bring those same guiding principles to a, an audience that might not otherwise be receptive, but has its foundations in the long lineage of what it means to be a human on the planet. It has its foundations in, in mm-hmm. ways of knowing. And I don't want to say it's been modernized because that creates some sort of value or judgment. It's not that at all, but rather it's being interpreted through the lens of the current Western cultural paradigm but that's my gut and my intuitive sense with this 
And I also yeah. think to add to that, Dana, is that biomimicry that you and Janine and those people in the circle that are trying to push, but it's not always the dominant biomimicry narrative. But again, that's why I say the language. That's not biomimicry, right? That's biomimetics. That's right. bio-inspired design. They're not actually practicing biomimicry. And so mm. that's the important distinction because, of, of course, as we started, we talked about the three foundational elements of biomimicry, which includes the reconnecting with nature and having an ethos. Biomimetics has no connecting with nature. That's not part of the process, nor does it have an ethos. It's merely about coming up with ideas. And so when people are, and I see it all the time, you know, you see news articles, they've labeled something biomimicry, but it is not biomimicry. And I'm sure, Melissa, you see that as well, where they label something as TEK or indigenous knowledge. And it's oh, like, yeah. oh, you know, mm -hmm. I can't police that. I can't be responsible for the misuse of it. I can only speak to what it actually is. Yes. I love the spirit in which you shared that deeper intention and meaning and value of biomimicry. I completely join with that because it's coming from a place of reverence and of respect, humility, a learning, what we call our learning spirits, engaging all of our learning spirits, meaning at different times of our life and different places and different situations with different peoples, we awaken different learning spirits spirits. So knowledge is very contextual. You spoke to that. So I can really join with the spirit in which you went down to the deep. How do we know what we know? I mean, that's the root of epistemology, right? And can we know nature in a way that is humble and respectful and yet keenly observant and curious without being invasive, right? I think that is a very interesting line. And I would say that's maybe one of the potential tensions or frictions between how I perceive TEK and biomimicry is that many different tribes have different taboos, like meaning there's a limit to knowledge and there's some things that we shouldn't know. And so, you know, you can learn up to a certain point, and then sometimes it's invasive. One example that's actually not more biological, it's more celestial or cosmological, is, you know, that we've been having a lot of lunar eclipses and some solar eclipses. And from a Western paradigm, we're like, let's go see, get the glasses. How can we see this eclipse and how exciting it is? But some tribes like the Navajo tribe feel like that is a really potent time when the sun and moon are aligned in a certain way. Some would almost say like an intimate act between them and that humans should not be even looking at that. Like we should be inside. We should be in a prayerful, reverential space and let the sun and moon do their dance and let that walk through that it's a potent, dangerous time. So that's just one example. And the same thing with dissecting animals. If we observe animals in their natural habitat in situ with their normal behavior, quote, normal behavior, we know humans have stamped their presence everywhere with roads and houses and culverts and dams, etc. Where are we going to bring them into a laboratory and then dissect them and dive deep into them and then trace their genetics? And there are some indigenous scientists who are happy to do that form of science, really what I would say more contemporary Western science that others would consider ethically invasive. So how do we get to the glue that is used by the California muscles to attach to rocks with big surf? Someone has to take that and analyze it, chemically analyze it, dissect it. And that's where I've heard some critiques by some Native elders and practitioners of native sciences who feel that gets to be a little invasive. I know that biomimicry to really get down to it for how we can emulate and mimic some of these materials, we have to do that form of science. It could be considered invasive. Yeah. And it's interesting in the, yeah, for sure at the material or the chemical level, um, what's interesting about blue mussels is, of course, we eat them, <laughs> right? Of course, you know? which is pretty and, uh, destructive. And uh, one of the things that we try to instill as part of the practice is 
approaching it with awe and gratitude. And so if you see the blue muscle, since you mentioned it, as this incredible organism that has created in its own body a glue that can cure underwater. Right? Not a single human on the planet has ever been able to do that. Right? Certainly not in a lab, let alone on themselves. Right? And so if we approach that with awe and reverence, as we ask permission, will you share your secrets? Right? Would you mind mm -hmm. teaching us? And especially if the end goal is so that we can create a glue that cures underwater versus creating a glue that poisons your water. And I think what's interesting, and this is a little bit of a backtracking a bit, perhaps there's always that tension in biomimicry of enabling technologies. And could some of these enabling technologies inadvertently enable further destruction, further colonization, and further, mm -hmm. maybe there's a reason we shouldn't be gluing underwater and then maybe we should just stay yes. out of it. And so yes. there's always some interesting yeah. tension there. And we've certainly experienced that as we work on projects and we try to have a very strong ethos as a filter for what we're willing to even attempt to solve. And you can usually find a path in which that research can be justifiable, right? So as we know with the blue muscle, That's right. it changes and it's now used as a glue in sheet goods so that one, it doesn't off gas. So it's not poisoning life forms. And two, the materials last that much longer. So that means fewer trees that have to be cut down, right? There are really valuable outputs that come from those lessons. Mm -hmm. And that's why we put ethos as a foundational piece. As you go about this, you need to ask the question, what's worth solving? What's worth even using this practice for? We better not use it to build a better nuclear warhead. But what would nature approve of us learning from this? How are we going to go about mimicking in a way that does not more harm, but actually creates a positive impact? And can we show up with gratitude and appreciation? Can we actually give back to protect the mm -hmm. habitat of the organism that inspired the innovation? So these are all built into the methodology as a way of cultivating that awe and respect. But I think it's interesting because we have not necessarily built into the methodology some self-limiting explorations. The Native Seed Pod is produced by the Cultural Conservancy with generous support by Tamil Pius Trust. To contribute to our polyculture and to find out more information, please visit us at nativeseedpod.org or nativeland.org.
so many questions. I love it. This is getting very juicy. I love that organically, Dana, you have really talked about what we call one of our original instructions, which is the honorable harvest a new form of research ethics in working with organisms, which is you ask for permission when you harvest something. You ask for permission and you wait for an answer. And that requires a different way of knowing right there. It's not just, oh, I'm gonna do a cost-benefit analysis in my head. Like, it really requires an embodied, intuitive way of knowing from the gut. I don't know if we're gonna take this. I'm not feeling a yes here. It's very obvious with fruit, right? When the fruit is ready, you put your hand up and it falls in it. It wants to give itself. When you're yanking on the tree and actually pull part of the branch down, no, that was not ready to come. The answer was no, and you didn't listen. And there's many examples in Native communities when we talk about listening to what a tree says or an animal says when we ask for permission to harvest them. And how do we listen to that answer? introduce ourself. Um, we're accountable. Um, we uh, don't take the first. We don't take the last. Uh, we give something in return. So I love that you are really um, offering a more indigenized perspective of research ethics in the relationship with the organism. This conversation is making me think back to what you said, Dana, about one of the frameworks that you have is thinking of what would nature approve? What is considered positive there? And I wonder if you can unpack that a little bit more with maybe some examples of work that you might have done, uh, projects that you might have worked on. Sure. I think one way that is, as we are working with organizations right now, we're calling it a journey to positive. And recognizing that much of what's been happening in the sustainability world for the last couple of decades has been moving towards minimizing negative impacts. In the last five, 10 years, you hear these goals of net zero as if that's the holy grail. But the reality is that we need to move past zero. And in that spirit of reciprocity, we need to actually, not only do we have to restore and fix what has been messed up, but we need to enhance. We need to add value back into the system. We actually have to be welcome species as opposed to, I think I mentioned before, ones that would be voted off the planet. So part of that approval is about getting to stay, right? Getting to stay here as a species. When we talk about a journey to positive, we bring in the model of ecosystems and really organisms where we talk about surviving as the sort of standard ESG practices and sustainability is you're just surviving. You're just ensuring that you're not going to go out of business because current business as usual, we call dying. The next phase of wellness and vitality for an organism is what we would call maturing. And when an organism matures, it has the ability to reproduce. So it can produce offspring, whether you're talking about an oak tree or an elephant, but they have enough resources in their context that they can yield some offspring. So we call that maturing. And we talk about how organizations and companies need to begin shifting towards the maturing phase, right? That you need to be thinking about not just yourself, but your offspring. Can you produce offspring? Can you um, produce entities that will have the ability to survive? You, you regularly see organisms that abort or self-absorb, uh, you know, a fetus if if they cannot, if the context won't survive, right? So, you begin to start thinking about the place that takes care of your offspring, and then journey to positive is moving into the thriving stage and the thriving stage honors and recognizes that the way you take care of your offspring is by taking care of the place that takes care of your offspring. So creating conditions conducive to life 
for the long haul, right? Setting up these reinforcing feedback loops that ensure even when you've aged out of the system that your offspring and your offspring's offspring will continue to thrive because you took care of the ecosystem. And so for the companies and organizations that we're working with, we're asking them to have that long view and ask how can they give back to the system? So here's one example working with a, a large consumer products good company, they use a lot of palm oil. Okay, we know palm oil plantations are hugely problematic. They've patted themselves on the back by only sourcing certified sustainable palm oil. Okay? And all that effectively means is that no virgin forest was cut down for that palm plantation, but it doesn't mean a whole lot more than that. Maybe minimal pesticide use and so on, but a palm plantation has no biodiversity or it's harmful for the workers. It's not that great. So even if it's a sustainable palm plantation, so working with them on two fronts, one can we identify and develop alternatives? Because what's beautiful about palm oil is it's shelf stable, right? So you don't need the same kinds of preservatives. It has a lot of the properties that they need it to have for the for whether it's our lotions on our face or whatever. So working, what can we learn from nature to help create an alternative that we don't need to harvest from palm oil? But at the same time, can we actually improve the quality of the ecosystem services in those palm plantations? Can we add biodiversity back in? Can we develop them into permaculture types of agriculture? Can we take care of the communities that take care of those places? Can we have a ripple of impact that extends in a way where the community is appreciative, the whole biotic community, not just the humans, but the whole biotic community appreciative, that company is there sourcing that palm oil. And not just because they made jobs, but they actually add value back to the system. And so that's the transition that we're making. And then get, getting guidance into what that looks like is about asking the local intact ecosystem what should we be doing here? What are you doing here? As a forest, I'm recharging the groundwater and I'm recharging it with 80% of the rain that falls ends up back in the groundwater. Okay, that palm plantation then should be putting 80% of the rainfall back into the groundwater. It should be functioning like that healthy, thriving ecosystem next door. We support this much biodiversity. Okay, that palm plantation should be supporting that much biodiversity. Right? So this becomes metrics and this path to moving from surviving to thriving. Yeah, that's that's a really interesting and exciting model to be looking at. And, you know, I would say to play devil's advocate a little bit, are the um, shareholders of that palm oil company willing to invest what it takes to make that more of a polycultural permaculture community forest ecosystem with rights and well-being for the local human community like that's a big investment and shareholders of companies really look for the bottom line and the bottom line for them is profit and often cutting corners by minimizing investments and in things that they see as superfluous to the bottom line of getting gallons of palm oil or tons of palm oil out and shipped to manufacturers. And that's why, and the first step in this phase is just the difference between the certified sustainable palm oil plantations and the ones that didn't bother getting certified. Right? And of course, yes. the certified ones the consumer in the supply chain, they pay more, right? They pay more for that. And yes, so there is that right. process. What's been interesting to watch is there's a shift in the larger economic zeitgeist is the license to operate. 
Right? So whether it's governments coming in and saying, you know what, this we're not going to allow this anymore. We're not going to allow this raping and pillaging of our lands and our people. And if you want to come in, then you need to do it differently. So there's starting to be some policy shifts. Simultaneously, mm. there's starting to be some economic supply chain shifts that are saying we need to do things differently. A case in point, many years ago when Walmart made a pledge that it would only source organic cotton for all of its brand clothing, it completely bought out at the time the organic cotton market. There was nothing, like they bought everything. <laughs> there was nothing left. Yeah. And the, but the side effect is that is then more farmers said, maybe I should convert because they're right. So it's, yes. it is that classic supply and demand. And it doesn't, I'm not arguing that there's still the shareholders that are holding out and so on. But what's interesting is that there are contextual forces that are starting to shift. Again, policy, some are economic driven, some are also contextually driven. So when you have a lot of these climate change effects, those plantations that have embodied some of these principles are more resilient. Are surviving. Right? They're surviving. Better, yes. And mm -hmm. as we were in this incredible time of transition where there are so many fantastic models to draw from, it's just a matter of decoupling all of the feedback loops that led us down one trajectory and creating new feedback loops that can lead us into a new trajectory. And we're witnessing this massive dismantling of those contexts, and it's gonna be messy. I think there's this beautiful opportunity, again, because we have this common purpose where that deep knowledge and those deep practices of both TEK and biomimicry can speed up some of those transition processes so that it's not a bunch of trial and error, but instead, it can be like, we've been living here a while. We can tell you. Mm -hmm. This is how we've been doing right? it. This is how mm -hmm. we've been doing it. This is what we've learned. This is what we've learned about the patterns. And to the point that you made, here's where Western science used well and used with the right mindset and ethics can come in and say, okay, we have these practices. We have these tools. We can measure it. The shareholders need to see some numbers to buy in, but we can measure it and then we can begin to shift the whole system. Exactly. And I think we're at this beautiful yeah. point of lots of tipping points where, you know, the opportunity to be a non-certified palm oil plantation, is no longer on the table. Those are done. All these things are starting to shift as well as bringing putting more and more lands back into conservation stewardship of indigenous peoples, right? I'm a good colleague of mine, friend, Nanette Arroyo from the Philippines. She's working out of Sweden now, but through the TED community, she got over $130 million to devote exclusively and distribute to indigenous communities around the world who are trying to take care. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, one thing that is interesting is can we look at money like the original shells or seeds as a currency, a flow of nutrients through our communities, through exchange cycling of nutrients, just like our bodies do, you know, getting back to that original roots of money being something of great value. So there is a room for conversation and there is some interesting conversation happening in philanthropy about decolonizing wealth and re-indigenizing an understanding standings of money and capital and currency with indigenomics, mm -hmm. the principles of biomimicry and the principles of indigenous knowledges into the way we reframe economics, same root as ecology. How do we manage our household yeah. in a sustainable, thriving, regenerative way? So it's very exciting to see bringing all these tools together. And in Robin Wall Kimmerer's chapter in the TEK book I co-edited, she does a beautiful 
metaphor of knowledge symbiosis, where she has TEK as the corn, the central core ethical basis. And she has Western science as the beans going around the ethics of indigenous science and using the curiosity and the inquisitiveness of Western science, but having the framework, the ethical framework of indigenous knowledge systems. It's a beautiful metaphor. So like you said, really Western science in service to important goals and with these appropriate ethical guidelines and restraint and humility is so powerful. And then the squash is what she calls the ethical space of engagement using Willie Ermine's beautiful metaphor that whenever two people meet, when two knowledge systems meet, we need that third space, which is that respectful reciprocal place. The squash provides shade it moistens the earth the soil it holds in moisture it provides coolness when it's hot out and so that ethical space is required you can't just have native science and western science together without that third space so that's what we're creating oh. here we're creating the squash. that's what we're creating the third <laughs> space we yeah. are the squash sisters to actually talk about that further because this is the piece I'm most curious about and perhaps most hesitant about in the sense of a hyper awareness of the perception and the long history of Western colonization of indigenous ideas and knowledge. And I know that biomimics in general are very interested about this narrative, but yet there's a huge amount of trepidation around doing it well, like finding a way that doesn't feel like the old colonial ways and that needs to be reciprocal in the sense of I mean, I have no shortage of biomimics who would like to engage and learn um, collaboratively in the intersection space with TEK, but we don't, I haven't seen a a run at the door of indigenous <laughs> students saying, let me learn about biomimicry. And we've had many starts over the years of trying to explore this space but it feels like we have to tiptoe around it so that we don't get egg on our face or look like fools or come across in a way. And But yet I feel like the only way pat forward is if there's that equal curiosity in a mutualistic way, which is what we also learn from nature, of here's what I need and here's what I offer from the biomimicry mm -hmm. side and from the indigenous mm -hmm. side, here's what I need and here's what I offer. And then to explore that in a very collaborative reciprocal way. I'm, I've been craving that for decades and without that sense of reciprocity, I don't know what the next step is. So I'm so grateful we're exploring this here and this podcast. Mm. I'm grateful we're exploring it with the center, the Biomimicry Center, and that this is a, a focus. But I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that, Melissa, on, on how, we, how we navigate that space. We're bringing our biomimicry professionals to Tofino. We're staying at a lodge that is dedicated to indigenous conservation issues. And this is going to be an important topic for us in September. And we're walking, we feel like we're walking a little on eggshells so that we don't mess up. And I'd love mm -hmm. thoughts and guidance. And I'm pretty certain any biomimic listening to this would also love to know how to do this well in a, in a way that, yeah, that serves our justice. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you for that uh, invitation for feedback. It's so important that you're moving into it with so much openness and care, thoughtfulness, um, humility, and a genuine spirit of, of giving and, and reciprocity. And you are in great hands. I think you'll be with um, Isaac Olam yes. Foundation with yes. Eli Enns, mm -hmm. a dear old friend and, and a great mediator, a great person who really links together different ways of knowing in a beautiful, respectful way, using the ethical space of engagement as a methodology for bringing diverse peoples together in a more ceremonial way, I guess you would say. Yes, it's, I, I think, to just summarize some of those frictions or doubts where it comes from is, I think we know where it comes from, but there's just, why well, you don't have Indigenous peoples pounding down the doors of the Biomimicry Center is you know, the fancy term of epistemic racism or epistemic hegemony, right? Just feeling so for so long beaten down like our knowledge is not relevant, it's not important, it's not real, it's superstitious, and that Western science is the penultimate way of knowing. And even though you do not have that feeling or you do not have that sense that Western science is the ultimate way of knowing, and maybe just saying that right up front. I've been versed in the Western sciences. I've learned so much about biology and design and architecture or engineering or whatever it is. And it's a wonderful way of knowing. It's a very powerful way of knowing. But it is not the only way of knowing. And in fact, there has been harm done, especially to indigenous peoples and people of color for centuries since this advent of Western sciences in Europe and against women, too, we know, of all colors and backgrounds. So just acknowledging science is not the ultimate knowledge with the capital T truth, and it has caused harm. And it's one story, one way of knowing, and that it needs to be more porous and open to working with other ways of knowing. And it's a powerful tool that can offer insights into natural systems. So there's a lot to offer. We have one student here who is a paleontologist and really interested, he's native, into fossils and animal insect interactions. And our native ecologists here, our elders, our plant earth keepers are super excited to learn about fossils from him because he just has this deep understanding of deep time and history and these really intricate interactions between certain pollinators and plants. So I'm seeing, witnessing a beautiful example of this knowledge symbiosis of this native young man with Western scientific expertise, offering it to a traditional elder with TEK knowledge expertise. And it's a beautiful dance, but it takes time to build that trust and those relationships. And then, of course, so much of our knowledge, our languages, in addition to our lands, have been stolen and misused and exploited and appropriated that there's just still a very genuine concern that sharing our knowledge, that it can be misused and abused. So there's a lot of trust building that needs to happen. Building relationships, building trust, getting to know each other as people, starting to give and receive in simple ways with food and gifts and laughter and walks on the ocean or wherever in the forest, in the prairie, wherever you may be. And then starting to open up about that question you asked in I was part of the Center for Whole Communities for many years, a wonderful group in Vermont where actually Toby Herzlich and many of us were very deeply involved. And one of the questions we always asked was, what are we vulnerable enough to ask for and what are we courageous enough to give? Right? And you basically said that same question. It sounds so simple, but when you really look in the heart, what do I need? What does my community need? What does my homeland need? And then what am I willing to offer in terms of a true reciprocity and exchange that will feed both parties? So I think you're coming with a great spirit and it's going to require a lot of patience. But I think and hope that this podcast will demonstrate with trust, with affection, with humor, with respect, we can 
really have some of these deeper conversations and begin to collaborate and unleash creativity in really new ways. What you both are saying right now makes me think of something that's that is important to both spaces, biomimicry and indigenous knowledge, which is language and the power of language and how a lot of the work that we're trying to do is this translation work. We also talk about that in biomimicry because it is about understanding the language of nature, but it's also about understanding languages of each other. We come from interdisciplinary backgrounds and we're trying to translate concepts between these different disciplines. And so there's a lot of power, I think, in what does it take to learn these different languages in a way? And so it's not just the semantic languages, but the languages that we all bring together to the table, I think. Fluency, yes. Translation and fluency in multiple ways of knowing and being, which the Western paradigm has been so hegemonic. I mean, I see it with my students. We don't, we don't even realize there are other ways of knowing and being, right? Unless people are generally bilingual or come from other countries, they everyone then clearly knows there are ultimate ways. But people who are born and raised often in America with English only. It's really been a loss of cognitive dexterity in being able to embrace and look at other ways of knowing. Yeah. Is it desired or viable to continue having this conversation and start to really sh- implement some form of co-produced knowledge base, including these ideas in your own work moving forward? So it's a plug-in for your own work. Basically. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But just to show, too, we're not just having a one-off conversation about it on a podcast, right. but we're actually really engaged and committed to this longer term in multiple ways. Yeah. I've had a dream for more than a decade of hosting a week-long experience, immersion, conversation, gathering with with the right spirited folks that want to approach it from a reciprocity perspective, half in the biomimicry world, half from the indigenous knowledge world, and really having an open agenda for the week, right? Relationship before task and an equal commitment to figuring out and helping template for others that are curious, what could this intersection bring about? Um, And I have no idea what the outcomes would be. And that's probably the most important thing to go in with an open mind. But I would love to see that happen. That's a wonderful dream, Dana. I think that would be so enriching and dynamic and just evoke and provoke a lot of deep learning. Yeah, thank you for that vision. I share that vision as well. And also, I've been dreaming about this conversation also for a very long time, over a decade, and that we're finally having it is fantastic. Yay. And thank you, Sara, for your leadership in making it happen. I mean, that's what it needed. I think Dana and I kept thinking about it, talking about it, but we're making it happen. And you're such a wonderful bridge with your leadership at ASU and the Biomimicry Center. And so I'm committed to this conversation long term, both through this wonderful new podcast, through uh, a gathering we're going to be having with uh, Native American teachers, looking at STEM education and the uh, role of biomimicry and creating more welcoming spaces to study science with cultural lenses and elevating TEK as an equal way of knowing the natural world and understanding science. 
I think that we're going to come up with a publication probably around these conversations based on the learnings from the podcast interviews that we're having with a number of folks. I know that many of my Indigenous science grad students are also very piqued interest by biomimicry and so wanting to keep nudging them to talk with you all and take courses. Also encourage your biomimicry students to take my TEK courses at ASU and come out to the field here at Heron Shadow and learn Indigenous agroecology to learn from the plants, learn from the animals, the land is teacher to embody that in place-based educational practices. So I think there's a lot of exciting synergy, our word of the day, happening and a lot of activities both in the universities, but also in community to advance this dialogue. I want to thank you both for um, engaging both your hearts and your minds and the experience that you bring forward for these decades of your life that is wonderful, sharing intimate stories about your love for certain organisms, to teaching us about honorable harvest, to really understanding what does it look like to start building a more reciprocal relationship between our two disciplines. I'm very excited to hear more of these conversations. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. This podcast would not have been possible without the generous support of the Institute of Humanities Research at Arizona State University, the School of Sustainability at ASU, the Biomimicry Center at ASU, the Cultural Conservancy Native Seed Pod, Global Futures, Indigenous Knowledge's Focal Area at ASU, the School for Complex Adaptive Systems at ASU, Biomimicry 3.8, the Learning from Nature podcast. And this podcast was hosted, written, and directed by Sara El Said, Lily Ehrman, and myself, Melissa K. Nelson of Anishinaabe and Metis Heritage. And this podcast would not have been possible without the amazing teamwork of the Cultural Conservancy's Native Seed Pod. We thank the producers, Mateo Inojosa, Mestizo Quechua, and Sarah Moncada, Yaki. We thank the co-producer, Raven Marshall, Dakota Lakota. Audio engineer, music, and soundscaping provided by Colin Farish, and partnership coordination by Alexis Stanley of the Diné, Akama, and Honduran peoples. Thanks also, for they all contribute to these conversations, this work, and our lives to the soil, microorganisms, food forests, seeds, ocean coral, redwood trees, rocks, rivers, birds, stars, people, places, and all of our kin. Chi we thank you so much for listening to our podcast. Shukran. Thank you.